Welcome to the Academy Podcast, where our mission is to improve lives through education, information, and some cool stories. My name is Dr. Irma Corral, and I'm really pleased to serve as the first ever guest host on this podcast. I am an Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health and the Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Kirk Krikorian School of Medicine at UNLV. Today, our guest is Dr. Annie Weissman. Dr. Weissman is the Director of Wellbeing and Integrative Medicine and an Associate Professor of Medical Education here at the Kirk Krikorian School of Medicine. In this episode, you will hear about the innovative integrative medicine curriculum that Dr. Weissman has implemented here and how this fits into the changing landscape of medical education. Dr. Weissman also dives into her journey to this role, her work providing care in hospice and other settings, and she also gives us her perspective as a local Las Vegan on everything from local activities to have on your radar for your well-being to what it means to this community to have the Kirk Kerkorian School of Medicine here accomplishing its mission. I hope that you find this episode and Dr. Weissman's heart and passion for her work as inspirational as I did. We're so excited to be here uh, today with Dr. Annie Weissman, who is the Director of Wellbeing and Integrative Medicine and also an Associate Professor in the Department of Medical Education. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you, Dr. Krell. I am so happy to be here. Well, um, it's been our tradition in this podcast to begin with people's origin stories, and I love a good origin story. So tell us a little bit about who you are, um, how you came to this role that you have here in the Mm -hmm. School of Medicine, and maybe some of your personal and professional uh, path um, directions, like what happened to kind of get you here where you are. Okay. Wow, my origin story. It doesn't start very far from here, actually. (laughs) So I was born here in Las Vegas at Sunrise Hospital. So um, I grew up over on the east side of Las Vegas. I came into this beautiful family. I have seven brothers and sisters. Oh, my goodness. I know. I'm from a really large family. And um, it was lucky growing up here, went to great schools, had um, a really fun time just kind of finding my feet and learning my way. Um, I went up to school in Reno, Mm -hmm. and I was there for a couple of years before I came back to Las Vegas. And my um, arrival back here was unexpected. I was in a near-fatal accident when I was 20. Uh, Yeah, so I woke up from my coma back here in Las Vegas at my mom and dad's house. I mean, I had been awake for several weeks prior to that, but I don't remember it because of Mm-hmm. my injuries. So I woke up to a whole new life down here in Las Vegas. And yeah. so it uh, sounds like that was a pivotal moment that sort of changed the mm-hmm. trajectory that your life had been on at before. Completely. Mm-hmm. So it was like waking up to a new life, which was amazing and also terrifying. Mm-hmm. So um, I ended up coming to UNLV as a non-admitted student mm-hmm. in 2000. And I took classes that first little bit. I suffered a severe traumatic brain injury. So they weren't sure if I was going to be able to learn or retain or or really function all that well. So I was lucky UNLV took a chance on me and I got to come back and try school. And thankfully it took and my brain continued to heal. So um, I ended up becoming a massage therapist after I graduated from college. Mm-hmm. Um, I was still pretty self-conscious about my brain and about my injuries, So, um, and I've always loved massage, so I chose to go to trade school and learn more about that. Mm-hmm. And while I was in my massage therapy training, that first week they had asked us to study a pathogen in relation to massage, and I used to do a lot of volunteer work in my degree in um, public relations for a local HIV and AIDS organization. So I chose that pathogen and started volunteering at AFAN where I had done PR and at the St. Therese Center and at the Pedregal House and I was doing free massage therapy for the clients and it was really interesting because their T cells and their viral loads were changing. Yeah. I didn't even know what that was back then. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so I started looking that stuff up and um, became really interested in what was happening. And I also noticed from a nonverbal perspective that the clients that were coming in, the first maybe week or two, there might not be much eye contact or open body language, but as time would go on, 
their bodies would open up more and they would talk more or make eye contact. And some of them were having regular blood work done through UMC's wellness center and they would share with me that their, you know, as their viral loads and T cell counts were changing, it was so interesting. So that ultimately made me a researcher. I ended up going back to school and UNLV was forming a school of public health around that time. So I was really lucky. That's an incredible story. So then it sounds like the patient interaction, Mm -hmm. um, it opened your eyes to maybe the connection between mind and body in a Mm -hmm. brand new way. Mm -hmm. And that changed the trajectory of your learning path. So you went into public health next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, how did you make the leap into academic medicine? How did that happen? So I was really lucky to be, I was a graduate assistant. I had three jobs throughout (laughs) my graduate school. And one of them, I was um, a graduate assistant for a time on um, a comprehensive sexual education grant. We were funded through the Office of Adolescent Health to work in African-American faith-based organizations here. And um, I was basically working the front desk table, checking in guests, and Dean Atkinson, our founding dean, was one of the guests. Oh, wow. And we struck up a really wonderful conversation. I had just finished working clinically in hospice, and I was asking her about, you know, why is it that it's not until end of life that patients are really getting this comprehensive, integrated care? And what are you going to be teaching at our new medical school, and what are you thinking about in terms of that? So um, that opened the door. We had some more conversations, and then when the job opened up, I applied and was hired. That's incredible. So I I wonder if that conversation planted a seed to kind of think about integrative medicine Mm -hmm. in the building of this school. Mm -hmm. Um, Are these offices, like the one that you work in, common in other schools, or is this unique? Um, Tell us a little bit about what the landscape looks like Mm -hmm. nationally. It's really interesting. Nationally, there are a lot more well-being offices, which is wonderful or wellness. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll see. You'll see a lot about resilience and burnout and these different measures. It's um, and there's there's been a lot of work done to this end. And integrative medicine as well. There's um, we're part. Of, our school is part of this academic consortium for integrative medicine and health. Mm-hmm. And there are I think close to a hundred member schools now many of which have electives and different programs in integrative medicine. What's really unique about our school, and I really deep bow of gratitude and thanks for Dr. Atkinson, because by her having this imbued as the beginning of our medical school's formation, I think we might be one of the only, if not the only medical school where all of our students are taking integrative medicine. And that's really unique and special. That's wonderful. As I think about how the landscape of medical education has changed over the years, Mm -hmm. it seems fairly recent that we're focusing on Mm -hmm. well-being as a core um, skill or Mm -hmm. area that we are encouraging our students to learn Mm -hmm. about. And so it doesn't surprise me to hear that there are some uniquenesses about what you're doing here mm-hmm. that make it stand apart, although the trend is, is changing a bit uh, mm-hmm. across the nation. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've developed a curriculum mm-hmm. here for our students. Uh, um, tell us about that. Uh, wh- what do medical students at the Kirk Korean School of Medicine learn about? Oh, so our students, we, we really look at the body You know, we look at the physical body, but we also talk at length about the emotional body, the mental body, the spiritual body. So we're looking at a whole person through that holistic lens. Um, We use some research and data and traditions. We use like traditional Chinese medicine. So our students will learn about in traditional Chinese medicine, you know, we'll look at the body through meridians and these energetic pathways. So they'll learn about that. In Ayurveda from India, that which is the oldest form of medicine, they'll learn a lot about you know how Ayurveda looks at health. So we'll talk about doshas, which are these three different centers that all of us have, and then we'll talk a lot about um, the different guiding principles of all of these different ancient techniques. And so our students get a sprinkling of a lot of the different ancient traditions. 
And then we also talk a lot about, you know, I, as a massage therapist, of course, I'm biased and I love bringing touch into our curriculum. But we also talk about energy work and we also talk about essential oils and we also talk about so many different healing modalities that patients will be using. You know, one of the first lectures or classes that we do is is about checking your face mm-hmm. and really talking to the students about body language. You know, yeah. like I spoke about with the HIV and AIDS patients that I used to get to work with, our body language is so important. And so I want to teach our students to really be mindful of how they're showing up mm-hmm. and what bias they're bringing into it. And when a patient is describing how they're choosing to heal or things that they're trying, that we don't cut them off or shut them down, that we can be in relationship with them and learn more. Mm -hmm. So um, we do spend a lot of time with communication as well and really focusing on building relationships. I I love the way that you described um, some of the exposure to these alternative modalities Mm -hmm. as as simply these are healing modalities Mm -hmm. that patients that they will see in the future Mm -hmm. Um, may access. Mm -hmm. And so having some real um, core information about some of those traditions, Mm -hmm. some of which are ancient and have been passed down lovingly over generations, Mm -hmm. um, it means so much to um, people that Mm -hmm. their physician might know about that. So I think that's amazing that we're actually teaching about that in in a meaningful way. Thank you. what do you think the reception has been like? Like, are are the students interested in this? Like, mm-hmm. are, are you um, seeing uh, follow up projects or um, mm-hmm. like what happens as they're uh, progressing through their uh, training? Does does it go away mm-hmm. once they hit the clinics? <laughs> Thankfully, no. You know, it's really been interesting because each year it's been different, mm-hmm. um, and it's. But I I think the things that I've noticed that have really stood out. There are some students that are really into it and and love it and are so interested. And then there are some students who are like, huh, what is this? (laughs) And then there's a lot in the middle. And so what I've learned to do or try to do is really invite all of the dialogue. If this feels like nonsense to you or you're frustrated about, talk to me. Let's, Let's bring this into the dialogue. And then for our students that are really passionate about it, they have the opportunity if they want to to do research with me during a summer block. And so what's come from that? We've had one student who helped have legislation changed in our state. And granted, this was on motorcycle um, riding because that's what the student was really passionate about. But it's it's been really fun. I, I I tease the students to really like find their me search, find that part of yourself that you're really interested in learning more about, the things that you're passionate about so that we can change these systems. I love that. Um, great advice, I think, for, oh, for any young student. Um, what can you tell us about maybe like what a typical day looks like for you in this role? Because it, it, you've told us a little bit about the teaching mm-hmm. piece directly with the students. Mm-hmm. Um, what other kinds of things does your office do? Gosh, a typical day. Um, I like to come here early. Um, I like the quiet in the morning. So I will come in and I always make a pot of coffee. (laughs) So I start my day there and then I like to sit down and take some quiet time to just look at email and really think about what the day will bring. Um, It was interesting prior to the school opening and us welcoming students, I had had this thought that we would wait to really do all of the community health work once we had the medical school program really going, but then when one October happened, mm-hmm. they st- I was really lucky and I started to do that in tandem. So some days I will do, like today I got to do some guest lectures over at the um, College of Southern Nevada. Um, so I'll do different talks in the community, um, follow up with research projects. I have a lot of research projects going. So um, mm-hmm. yeah, I'll, I'll just try to like, look at my calendar, <laughs> see yeah. where I need to be mm-hmm. and where my energy needs to go. And then I spend my time meeting with people, doing different talks, and then looking at the research that um, we're working on right now. Mm-hmm. Now, um, you and I know each other personally as well mm-hmm. outside of this. And um, I'm aware that you have connections to a lot of community organizations. Mm-hmm. And so 
uh, just like you just mentioned, the community college um, partners that you work with. Um, mm -hmm. It sounds like there's a lot about the work that you do that's about dissemination, not mm -hmm. only in Las Vegas and Southern mm -hmm. Nevada, but statewide. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about some of your work um, with Mind Body and, mm -hmm. and sort of uh, sharing your skill set and your knowledge across the state. Sure. So, um, gosh, in the aftermath of the shooting, one of my colleagues had reached out and connected me with the Center for Mind Body Medicine. And it's been such a beautiful journey because this is a population wide trauma response, which I love as a public health person. Mm -hmm. I love population wide interventions. And it's it's been really cool. We've been able to teach um, close to 250 people now in our state these different skills and they're really simple like one of the things that we do is called soft belly breathing mm -hmm. and it's just a way of breathing that helps bring our bodies out of fight or flight and so like this morning when I was over at CSN this was what I was teaching was just you know and I do this a lot when I teach too we'll start class with a few breaths together to just kind of bring everyone into the room get our nervous systems, you know, kind yeah. of settled down. And then um, we breathe in through our noses and we think of the word soft and we exhale through our mouths and we think of the word belly. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very, very simple. And people, you know, I'll invite them to close their eyes um, and do that. And sometimes we'll do active meditation or expressive where we'll shake and dance and, you know, we'll pick different music for that. And then... Um, We'll also do mindfulness from time to time with different foods or different experiences. Mm -hmm. And statewide, you know, it's been really interesting because I started just next door at the coroner's office. Yeah. Um, I started working with their team after the shooting, and um, it's been so great to be with them. And then police and fire and mm -hmm. really wherever I'm called. So just teaching these really basic human skills. So it sounds like in many ways what these groups have in common is they're first responders one way or another. Um, mm -hmm. And so when they've experienced collective trauma, population level trauma, mm -hmm. it is important to think about their well-being as well. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we don't think about our first responders mm -hmm. as, as needing an intervention or, or assistance mm -hmm. in that area. So. Mm -hmm. um, but they also strike me as a, a tough um, audience for some of these things. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, what's what's it been like to teach uh, to that particular audience um, from your perspective? It's been awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's yeah, for sure. I'm I'm not a part of the team, but they've yeah. also been really cool mm -hmm. in welcoming me. You know, I'm doing some work right now with our BLM, our Bureau of Land Management, Wildland Fire teams, and it's similar. Mm -hmm. You know, they, these different groups of people that do this incredible work. And I'm clearly an outsider, <laughs> but it's also okay. We just name it and we are human together. So we breathe together. We check in. We talk about whatever's going on in our lives. You know, we just, it creates this really safe container to just be messy humans together. Mm -hmm. And I found over the years of doing this work that that authenticity and just being who we, who I am and how I am, mm -hmm. it typically works out pretty nicely like we have some really cool groups and we make a lot of progress together and what's rad about the group dynamic is somebody could be sharing something and another person is learning something about themselves just by witnessing or listening to the experience of another mm -hmm. and it's been really powerful over the years to just watch that unfold repeatedly mm -hmm. and just to think like we're all in this together truly yeah I, I, you're making me think of um, sort of the the humanity in all of us that sometimes, depending on like your career or your job duties, mm -hmm. it, there is almost like a sense of we have to put up a barrier or a wall. Mm -hmm. um, but in many ways, a, a lot of what your experiential um, exercises are about mm -hmm. and the, the teaching that you bring to these groups, mm -hmm. it's about just being human, right? Yeah. It's about like... Um, uh, holding space sometimes mm -hmm. and and being present in the mm -hmm. moment, which can be a tough skill to uh, master. I think when you work in a in a role like a first responder or yeah. or physicians, I mean, yeah. there's there's definitely some overlap there in those groups. Oh, for sure, for sure. And it's interesting coming into this field from a massage therapy background, mm -hmm. where I I feel like in massage we are very 
sometimes or most of the time we're pretty present with our emotions and how it feels and there's this awareness and it's openness about discussing our being and it's been interesting I remember working in hospice all those years and really mal for me it was pretty maladaptive because I was like I'm fine (laughs) (laughs) I'm a death person this is okay I'm used to this and in some ways I was, and in many ways I wasn't, because I yeah. I didn't take the time to grieve or to feel. Mm-hmm. And so it's been really interesting now being out of those settings. I, I really miss caring for patients at the end of life. That's something I'm really drawn to. I mm-hmm. used to think before I started here, I would split my career and do half labor and delivery and half hospice. And you know, do research in between. But um, mm-hmm. it's been interesting to be in this world and to have really starting to create that space to feel what I'm feeling, to notice it. And again, I think it's a lot of that training through the Center for Mind-Body Medicine helped me mm-hmm. because I wasn't really good at that before when I was younger. I just chose to numb or disassociate or ignore or put away so it's been a different different experience Mm -hmm. yeah I'm reflecting on a bit of about what you're saying and and thinking about the messages that we send to physicians in training whether they be Mm -hmm. um, you know explicit or implicit Mm -hmm. but a lot of times the message that we send is that you do have to be sort of Mm self-contained that in order to keep patients centered um, there's almost like a, a benign neglect of the self that has to happen as part of the role. And, and, um, but that's, that's shifting, I think, now in, in the message that we're trying to send future physicians. And this is a shift in how traditionally um, physicians have been trained. Mm-hmm. I'm really glad to see that, too, because mm-hmm. I think I completely understand leaving ourselves out of it because mm-hmm. of it's the patient's experience. Right. And I think we miss that human connection mm-hmm. when we deny what we're feeling. So it's, um, it's going to be interesting to see what transpires. Just today there was an article that came out. A medical student had written a commentary about the first death that they witness mm-hmm. and asking for the attendings or the people that are with them to allow for some space and to name it. Mm-hmm. And I think what what a time to be in medicine. You know, I think it's going to be really cool to see these openings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at Dell Medical School, they do this awesome thing where they have these debrief things that are on all of their name tags. And in real time, Mm -hmm. they debrief. So when there's something. So I'd like to bring that here. We're working on it now to just you know, when things happen in real time, be human together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk about it. Yeah, and I, it also makes me think of sort of uh, there's like a spectrum of experiences that mm-hmm. can happen. And there are some folks that can witness a death and be mm-hmm. okay to move forward. Mm-hmm. And, and there's going to be the, the folks on the other end of the spectrum mm-hmm. who really want to respect um, what that means. Mm-hmm. And um, they're going to need a little bit more time to process. Mm-hmm. And so when I think about open um, opportunities sort of that are opening in medicine, maybe it has to do with that understanding that there's a whole spectrum of human feelings that can happen with situations and that there's no like right way Mm -hmm. to respond sometimes so we can support each other by making space for Mm -hmm. whatever comes up in the situation. Yeah, Yeah. I'd love to see that. I'd love to see more around grief and loss, Mm -hmm. you know, especially coming through this pandemic and thinking about how all of us have experienced this in different ways. Mm -hmm. I I think it'll be really cool to see what unfolds. Mm Yeah, and it, it's also um, interesting to think about um, what's still ongoing, right, from the mm-hmm. pandemic with the mm-hmm. uh, long COVID, how mm-hmm. that's impacting people. Um, there's a lot of issues with um, um, sort of side effects and, and complications that we're still just trying to figure out, like mm-hmm. what's the best way to treat. And it's looking like some mind-body um, interventions have showed some promise, which mm-hmm. is so I'm glad that they're even thinking about that, and, and that's on the radar. But mm-hmm. I'm not sure we're done. No, no. Yeah, figuring <laughs> out like you know how, how what are all the ways in which COVID is going to continue to impact our lives. Oh yeah. yeah, 
It was so interesting when that pandemic was beginning. It reminded me so much of the beginnings of the HIV mm. epidemic and how, you know, what we do as humans when we're faced with something unknown. And it was just, and how much complementary alternative or integrative medicine comes into play when we don't have, you know, an evidence-based something or other that you know, use this first line. It, it's interesting to see what are the ways that we know we can heal? Mm -hmm. What are the ways that we believe? So it's been really interesting to see that again. Mm -hmm. um, was it always your plan to end up here in Las Vegas? Like, did you ever think about leaving or going oh, somewhere yeah. else? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. So growing up here, I was like, I'm out of here. And um, I didn't go far. You know, I just went up to Reno. I love to snowboard and um, it was great in-state tuition, so um, I was really lucky to go up there. And then right before I met my husband, I was planning on going to New York. I have this fascination and deep pull <laughs> to the East Coast. I love New York City. It just it feels like the center of the universe to me. And um, while I was really exploring all of the different things with um, HIV and massage, there were some. There had been really great things that had happened in New York and Manhattan and also in San Francisco. So I was really thinking about that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I met my husband and fell in love and stayed. Um, but yeah, I, in my family's here, I have seven out of the eight of us live here and my parents are here. So yeah. who knows? I mean, Ted and I used to always say when our son was grown, we'd go to New York or Boston. But I think life's been pretty good to us here, so we'll see what we can continue creating. Yeah, sounds like there's some deep roots here for sure. Mm -hmm. um, it's making me think, too, about like the long history that you have working with some of these community mm -hmm. partners. And and um, I'm wondering about like when the school opened, mm -hmm. whether the mission of the school was part of what drew you here, um, <laughs> being a native Las Vegan, yeah. and like what, what does it mean for the community to have the school here? Oh, that, yes, it, why I work here is is the mission of this school. Yeah. I, I am so drawn to that. And, you know, it's so interesting. I think what I loved so much about how this school was formed and, and Dean Atkinson's approach, she really got to know our community and then planned the school according to the needs that she saw by getting to know us. And I just, I loved that humility it wasn't like, I'm coming in here to fix, you know, so it was really beautiful. And I think that this school, I really believe that we can improve and dramatically change the health outcomes in our state in less than a generation. Mm -hmm. What I love about medicine, what I love about public health are the same things I love about integrative medicine and all of these different um, concepts. So I think bringing those together and disseminating them into the community, the stuff that I teach isn't rocket science. It's about connection. It's about community. It's about breath. It's about nutrition. It's about relationships. So I think the more that we can really strengthen that here and get access, mm -hmm. the better. Yeah. I love that. And I also, I want to say, I think saying it's not rocket science really under sells it a little bit. <laughs> oh. <laughs> because it's so important, right? It's yeah. sort of the art of medicine. It's yeah. about the heart and soul. Um, yeah. And so it's the other the other piece, you know, in addition to the technical knowledge mm -hmm. and, and all of the things that physicians have to know to mm -hmm. be good doctors. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of about how to be the human mm -hmm. that you are uh, in mm -hmm. that role and, um, and, and really step into it, I think, mm -hmm. um, mindfully. Mm. So I, th that's so important. Mm -hmm. so I, I, I think let, let's not discount the work that you do. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I, I don't mean to discount it. Mm -hmm. I think... What I think what I mean when I say it's not rocket science is I also, I want people to know how accessible yeah. things can be with just changing our breath mm -hmm. or by, you know, so yeah, I think that's part of it. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. Um, and you were just mentioning the public health perspective uh -huh. and it's some of the interests that you have in uh, more like a population level mm -hmm. work. Um, your scholarly work prior to coming here, like did that influence the path in any way? Or um, how are you continuing to stay active with your scholarship? Mm. I'm doing a lot, a lot of work with our students. So each summer I do an integrative medicine research track where our rising second years can do research projects with me. 
And so um, it has kept me really active from a scholarly perspective. And I'm, I'm really curious. There are so many things. I was just meeting with the student before you and I came in. And mm-hmm. I, I love the population health approach of public health. I think it is so interesting. And it's fascinating to me how much our systems and our policies like help determine or detract from health. Mm-hmm. You know, it's so interesting living in this community, which which has so much opulence and so much, yeah. and then there's so little. And so I'm really interested in, in, in issues of equity and in access. Um, I'm really passionate about nutrition, and I love to eat. I love food. <laughs> and I think <laughs> food is also one of those things that bring us together, so it's fun to work with that with our students and think about like, how are we talking to patients about this? How are you feeding yourself? So Mm -hmm. yeah, there are so many areas that I get interested in that I get to play with and Mm do. No, um, nutrition is also part of the curriculum. Is that that right? Yeah. And that also strikes me as a little bit unusual in that most medical schools don't have um, a lot of hours devoted to that topic. Um, Right. how, How is the experience of our students here unique? Well, it's, we're really lucky. Yeah. Um, suppo- we're supposed to have 25 hours of nutrition education in our um, medical training. Most medical schools report in the data that they're not quite hitting that, so that's interesting. And I was stunned. When I started this job and being brand new to medical education, I assumed that nutrition had a much more prominent role. And um, the first couple of years, we did this really cool food as medicine day with the Wynn Hotels. And their chefs did the best thing with our students. And they would share ways that they had modified recipes. And at that time, they had a lot of vegan and vegetarian options. And then they would do a tasting with our students. And their back of the house is really cool because they have it all color coded, or they did back then. So that it was like red, yellow, green, and like reds were things, you know, you shouldn't have that often and, you know, how the rest of the stoplight would go. Mm. And I wanted our students to see that from a systems perspective because when they're eating in hospitals and just thinking about these different ways that we feed ourselves. And then when Dean Kahn came, he brought to us the curriculum from Tulane, Mm. the Health Meets Food curriculum that Dr. Tim Harlan created. And Dr. Harlan was my dream because he was a chef first and then he became a physician. (laughs) So this curriculum was perfect because it has case studies Mm -hmm. that the students go through paired with different recipes. And then the students break up into small groups and do it. So I'm really proud that we have that. And most recently, we've been so lucky because UNLV has an integrative health sciences program that has nutrition in it. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Laura Kreskel runs that program. And she and I were on a dissertation committee together and started talking and I just said, hey, we have this culinary medicine class, you know, could we talk about maybe partnering? Mm -hmm. And at that time she had just opened this kitchen in the pantry at at UNLV. So um, our students started going over there for the cooking and her master's students would work with our students, which was great because I'm not a nutritionist, I just love food. So (laughs) it's been really cool to start partnering with them. And I have this dream or this vision of really building out the nutrition component more fully and calling on all of these wonderful chefs that live in our community to help us build a program where we're doing culinary medicine throughout the valley and different people can learn how to cook, how to feed themselves with different recipes. And I think that that nutrition component is really our first line of medicine. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to play with that a lot more. Yeah, I'm so glad to hear you say that. um, a lot of times I've heard like critics of our current state of mm-hmm. the way that we practice medicine that is more of a sick care mm-hmm. model than a health care model. Mm-hmm. And what they're criticizing is our lack of um, work in preventive medicine, mm-hmm. right? So when we think about lifestyle interventions, like changing your diet, mm-hmm. um, there seems to be like room for improvement in some of those areas. But it, it's wonderful that our students are getting exposure mm-hmm. to some real information. Yeah. Um, regarding nutrition. Um, in my past work, I worked a lot with bariatric surgery candidates. Oh, cool. And one of the things that they would often share with me is their confusion about nutrition mm-hmm. and how they had tried for years to talk to their physicians about that and would get a lot of conflicting information mm-hmm. about what's the best practice for mm-hmm. their particular situation. So I think 
um, you know, for the future of medicine, that's definitely an area where um, we have room for improvement. And th there's great opportunities, I think, to empower our students mm -hmm. to have more information there. Oh, for sure. There's there's such cool things happening to that end. You know, it's interesting. When I was in graduate school and I was working in hospice, you know, most of the days, then in public health school mm -hmm. at night, it was so interesting to be at end of life all day and then in prevention all evening. Yeah. And think about, like, how can we do this differently? Like, I understand that we will all die, but, like, what if we had these different interventions earlier mm -hmm. so that we could choose how we wanted to live maybe a little bit differently? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I think we're heading that direction, mm -hmm. which gives me hope. Yeah, me too. It mm -hmm. really does. Um, when you think about Southern Nevada and, mm -hmm. and where we are with um, integrative medicine in general, mm -hmm. do you see other opportunities that you think might come to fruition in the next 10, 15 years? I do. So my dream, what I have been holding in my heart and my head since, gosh, graduate school was really, I'd like to create an integrative medical center here where we do treatment, research, and training. So I'd love for our patients in our clinical settings to all have integrative care, mm -hmm. where at each visit they have um, that whole person care provided. I'd love to do lots of research on this and really examine what different modalities help people and kind of examine it that way. And then I think for training, it would be fantastic to have at all different levels of education from community to you, you know, undergraduate medical education like we currently provide and share our curriculum with other medical schools, mm -hmm. getting into more of the graduate medical education space, working with residents. And then I'd love to see a residency program here along with community programming where anybody can come and learn about these different modalities and we could have workshops. I think that's something I'd love to see in my lifetime mm -hmm. while I'm on this planet. So we'll see. That sounds like a great goal. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I think the, the community would definitely benefit from that. Um, well, we, we've talked a little bit about your work with students, a little bit about your work with communities. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in your work assisting or helping with faculty or staff issues. And um, we were just speaking about the COVID pandemic a little while ago. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lot of talk since the pandemic about burnout. Mm -hmm. But burnout is sort of the, the end of the um, mm -hmm. process, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, um, what are some things that people are doing, thinking more from a prevention side? Like, mm -hmm. how do we prevent burnout for staff, mm -hmm. faculty that work in healthcare? Any thoughts on that? Oh, I have lots of thoughts <laughs> about this. You know, I think one of the things for me that really are, is helping our boundaries mm -hmm. with technology having boundaries is more difficult. So I think something that we, we have to normalize in medicine are boundaries and, and work times and being pretty explicit with that. And I understand that when we're clinical or there's other things happening that those can get blurred, but I think it's important for us to be really mindful of setting time for work and then having the time and the space to even detach from that or to yeah. release that so that when we go home we can be present with whatever it is that we do at home and then also finding things that we can do that replenish us I, I know for me I just feeling having felt like I've been in survival mode for so long in different ways like learning okay what looking at like Maslow's hierarchy okay what are the things to do and how do we stabilize this? So thinking about like our healthcare system, if people are currently fried, let me tell you how excited they are when I come in to teach them to breathe. <laughs> you know, they already feel like they don't have time. Right. And so I think I want to really see this from more of a systems aspect. Mm -hmm. um, in my career, and it's only been eight years in medicine, but I've seen it go from what I've perceived to be more of an individual mm -hmm like you should do this or this or this to more of a we should and now more of a wait a minute what's happening in this system and how can we change this so that you know we can have all of these skills but if we're going into a system that is not well mm -hmm. or we're working with a lot of people that are fried 
how do we as an individual affect the system? So I'm right now I'm really interested in systems change, mm-hmm. but I'm also thinking about it from an individual level as a person. What are the things I can do so that I can be responsible for the energy that I bring into the room? Right. I can be responsible for the way that I show up, the way that I interact, the the way that I speak. You know, there's so many things that I can do, so I, I try to focus on that. Like where where are the things that I can control or I can do? And then when I look at the rest of it that may feel outside, it's forging alliances and saying, hey, I see this, like naming it. Mm-hmm. I think one of the things I'd love to see in medicine is just like, let's let's name. Like Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> and, you know, in recovery, we name what's going on. And then there's all these steps that we do to get better or to do things differently. So I think why, maybe let's approach it kind of like that. Mm -hmm. Let's name it and let's work together to shift out of it. Mm -hmm. Well, in some ways, I think what you're saying is, you know, a multi-level intervention is probably going to be the most effective. And Mm -hmm. we know from other areas of public health that that's true. Um, so it's important to equip people with good coping skills and, mm-hmm. and, and things that they can do themselves mm-hmm. to help themselves, right? Um, but as you said, if we're sending them into a system that's causing some of the um, kind of the social determinants of burnout, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. then, um, you know, we can think about what are the opportunities there, mm-hmm. like in the collective, mm-hmm. right, the um, – sort of the connections with each other, the peer mm-hmm. support, but also even higher up than that, thinking mm-hmm. about the institution's responsibility. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When there's so much um, about the connections and the relationships. And yeah. so I think wherever we can to help prevent the isolation mm-hmm. or the, you know, so often I'll hear, I thought it was only me. Yeah. So normalizing that like, it's okay to not be okay. Mm-hmm. You know, I think in the time that I've grown up, it's like every fine and happy and great. And that's wonderful when it's happening, but it's also not all of the time or normal life. Yeah. So making space for like that wider range of human experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's important. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one of the other uh, topics that we often ask our guests about is their experience with mentorship and how that's mm-hmm. shaped their trajectory into medicine. and. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious about mentors that you might have had, people Mm -hmm. that sort of um, helped shape this path for you. Oh, gosh, I've had so many. I wouldn't be alive today, truly, if it weren't for the mentors that I had. Um, You know, my family, my parents have been just incredible. I have a twin who has kept me on this planet. (laughs) And then um, I was really lucky when I was young and really trying to find my way after my accident and not really sure what to do. One of our family friends, Bruce, he really looked after me and tried to help me find my path and was such a dear friend and mentor. And he's he's the one that really taught me about relationships. You know, he um, had built a whole incredible empire here back when he was Um, a young man and it was really interesting to learn from him about relationships and the importance of of that and he was always so kind and um, my friend Mara her mom Jan was a really good advocate and ally for me when I was going through some different challenges when I was young and she helped remind me that I was going to be okay and the worst things that happened to me weren't going to be the things that defined me Mm. and that I could be whoever I wanted to be and figure this life stuff out. So I was really lucky to have a lot of hands that reached back and pulled me up. That's amazing. So it sounds like a lot of these folks were um, in your life from a long time ago. And so Mm -hmm. possibly still in your life as well. Mm -hmm. And then more recently, you know, getting to work with Dean Atkinson, when I first started, she's been a really great mentor and friend to me. And, you know, Ellen Cosgrove and the different team that first started here and then the newer, you know, the people that have come in. I feel like I've learned so many things from all of the people on my path and the different careers that I've had. Mm -hmm. I have been surrounded by really great people who have taught me so much. Yeah, that's great. I, I think in some ways, um, many of us that are educators end up being, you know, like an, an amalgam of <laughs> like all of the mentors that we had. And 
the best qualities that we really admired about them. So it sounds mm-hmm. like you've been able to take a little piece of so many of these uh, important influences in your life. And mm-hmm. And that's shaped who you are as a mentor, I imagine. Oh, thanks. I hope so. I'm <laughs> like, I have no idea, but I try each day. <laughs> um, what are some of the things that you do outside of work that sort of help to keep you grounded? Oh, I love, we just bought our very first home. So I love being home. Mm-hmm. It feels so good there. I hang out with my husband. When our son comes over, that's really fun. He just graduated. Um, we play with my dog. Um, I have a giant dog, so he's lots of fun to play with. I love spending time with my extended family. Um, I also really love being outside. I love going for walks. I just being outside soothes my soul. Mm-hmm. Growing up here, we used to go to all the different mountain ranges because there's a gazillion of us, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it was free entertainment. So I love going up to the mountains. Um, mm-hmm. Love to snowboard when there's snow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I traveling when when we can. I have a wanderlust. Yeah. Also, that it sounds like there's quite a, a range of activities that mm-hmm. you enjoy outside mm-hmm. of work. Fantastic. I always love asking that question of people who uh, work in like mental health or mm-hmm. well-being work, um, because um, there's kind of a running joke, right? That sometimes we're uh, not the best example <laughs> <laughs> totally. of work-life balance when we're the ones teaching about that topic. Yeah. So, um, but I love when people actually practice what they preach, oh. and it sounds like that's something that you strive to do. I do. Live music, too. I forgot, <laughs> but, you know, we, before the pandemic, my husband and I went to the, these festivals, and I was like, being at a concert is the best thing for me. <laughs> I just love music and just how it feels to be in community with so many people. Mm-hmm. It was, yeah, so live music also really feeds my soul and show tunes. I nice. have been known to drive around when I used to do home <laughs> care for hospice and belt out my show tunes. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite? <laughs> Rent. from okay. Yeah, that actually, when I used to volunteer at AFAN, um, or Annie, because, I mean, yeah. <laughs> but um, back when I used to volunteer at AFAN, their project up front, team used to sing Seasons of Love and I had no idea what that was from and my friend Earl and I used to be like kind of making fun and then I watched the play and I was just blown away so I I love musical theater I just think it's beautiful way to express emotion Mm -hmm. that's beautiful Uh we live in a great city to experience that so everything comes to Vegas right right thank goodness (laughs) So um, since you grew up in Vegas, I'm really curious about some of your favorite places where you spend your time. um, And you um, I know that you're a foodie as well. So uh, (laughs) tell us about some of your favorite places to eat in Las Vegas. Oh, my goodness. So I am so lucky to have grown up here and our food choices have expanded greatly from the time I was little. Right now, we just moved to the middle of town, and there's a bagel shop up the road from our house that has this giant bagel you can see from the highway, and um, it's uh, fantastic. It's Bagel Mania, so we'll go there on the weekends and get breakfast, and that is so fun. It used to be over in this strip mall um, over on Twain, and now it's on Convention Center Drive, but we love going over there. That's our weekend morning treat um gosh for dinner italian food we love if we're gonna go by genre yeah mastriani's <laughs> is one of our favorites it's up in summerlin on wallapai and desert inn mm-hmm. and my husband and his dad used to go there when he was young and the owners from new york so ted and i like to sit at the bar and just shoot the breeze with them and watch them make the food and the food's perfect yeah um for dessert uh, Cold Stone. <laughs> they nice. have my favorite ice cream. It's like chocolate and peanut butter. Mm-hmm. Um, for steaks, we like. We I just went to Bob Taylor's last night. It's this old steakhouse that's been here since 1955. It's really fun. And when I was a child, there was nothing around it. <laughs> and now it's in the middle of all these subdivisions. So right. that's fun. The Bootlegger's really fun. Mm-hmm. That's a place that's been here forever. Um, so yeah, all kinds of different foods. Nice. I love uh-huh. that you have a connection to so many like institutions of oh. Las Vegas, right? <sighs> Things that have been here for a long time. Yes. Um, so outside of food, mm-hmm. like, uh, what other kinds of places do you spend time in? Oh, 
I love, like I said earlier, being outside. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to work at Lake Las Vegas. We got married at Lake Las Vegas. And I've spent a lot of time out there. For me, it feels really healing. So I love going out there and just sitting or walking around. Um, I love driving on the 95 North, just past Indian Springs. You'll notice there's like a little structure and a grove of trees, which is odd because it's the middle of the desert. Yeah. And when I was in massage school, my friend Gianna shared this with me, and it's the coolest spot. It's um, this temple, and inside of it, there's like an Egyptian goddess, and there's a big Madre del Mundo, and there's all of these different female representations of mm. divinity. So mm-hmm. it's called the Goddess Temple. I love going up there. I just think it's really groovy. And there's a labyrinth you can walk, and it's like just diagonal from Creech Air Force Base. So it's really interesting because it's this like juxtaposition between like an Air Force Base and this temple of like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> so. And then Red Rock, I love, love, love. Mm -hmm. There's, um, on that scenic loop, there's, I think it's called Icebox Canyon, but we used to hike it when we were kids. Mm -hmm. So any of those places around town um, give me lots of joy. I I love that I'm adding that temple to my (gasps) to-do list. (laughs) I feel like it energetically, it is my control alt delete. Whenever things, when I used to see patients for hospice um, in Pahrump, I used to see patients there on Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. And I would take the long road sometimes just to sit there for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. There was just something about sitting in that space that when I could like set all my grief down or set down what I needed to. And I always felt like within the next 24 hours, I was like, huh, okay, I think I know what to do now. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Is there a favorite morning routine that you have that you'd like to share with our listeners? Oh, for sure. Um, I love getting up and getting my first cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There is something so lovely. We, uh, well, I'll just have my coffee in the morning. And we, I like to start my day really slowly. I am not one of those people who gets out of bed and is like, there yeah. you go. <laughs> I'm a slow burn. Uh-huh. So um, I love getting up and having a cup of coffee with my husband and kind of talking about the day that's ahead of us. He'll tease me because I never know what's on my calendar until day of. I don't frequently look ahead. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll talk about our days. We'll walk the dog. Um, And the neighborhood we live in, it's like old Las Vegas. And there's just something magical about being outside each morning and taking it in and then getting ready for the day. Mm -hmm. And then I I still do what I used to do when I worked in hospice, where each morning I'll I'll kind of just notice my feet on the ground and think about, you know, for this day I'm here. I'm on this planet. What do I get to do? And then my prayer or my thought is I often will hold my wrists and think whatever I touch, whomever I touch today, may I send out love and kindness and also not take on whatever is not mine. Mm -hmm. And I tend to build like a little bubble around myself (laughs) where um, I can bring in, Mm -hmm. you know, the love, the joy or whatever I can to each situation. But again, not taking on that, which isn't mine. Yeah. And so I try to do that each morning so that I can be really clear and kind Mm -hmm throughout the day and not leave feeling wrecked. <laughs> yeah, that's lovely. So it's about sort of mm-hmm. setting your intention for mm-hmm. your energy for the yeah. whole day. Mm-hmm. And as the day ends, even kind of doing a similar, like listening to some music on the drive home or kind of detaching from, I always will have a cup of tea and a bath. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, day's over. And then when I pull the drain, I'm like, bye-bye. <laughs> like, the day is over. Yeah. I let it all go away. Mm-hmm. So the wind down routine is important. For sure. Mm-hmm. I really like those boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> the bookends, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and if we were to catch you on a day off from work, let's say in the morning, 10 a.m., yeah. where might we find Dr. Annie Weissman? Oh, I'm chilling. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I might be in my house playing around. I might be outside. I might be driving up to the mountains. Um I love a day off. Mm -hmm. It's such a luxury. When I was in graduate school, there weren't many of those. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But whatever the day brings, I just kind of go with what I feel like. Um, Well, thinking a little bit about mentoring sort of Mm -hmm. in a different direction, um, 
what what advice do you find yourself giving future physicians, the the students here at the School of Medicine, um, regarding kind of the like where the future of medicine is heading and how integrative medicine can be a part of their journey? Mm-hmm. I think about it. There was this phrase early in the school's inception about being high tech and high touch, and I love that because I think about using the best of what we have with technology, but also the most of what we have as humans and how that intersects. I think that that to me is a really cool way of blending all of all of the different things that we have at our disposal. And I think for our students, it's really remembering who they are and what they're passionate about so that they can come in as their whole selves taking care of whole people mm-hmm. and not fragment or you know just be this or that like i want them to continue growing and evolving and being curious but also being fully human mm-hmm. yeah i think that that's something very powerful that you're saying that um we recognize their full humanity mm-hmm. and we encourage them to be authentic mm-hmm. and to be who they are mm-hmm. um, all the way through their training mm-hmm. yeah Wonderful. Um, there are um, a couple other things that had been on my mind to ask you about. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking about your work with hospice in particular. Um, and when I think about other people I've met that work mm-hmm. in that area, most people say, you know, it's it's a tough area to work and it takes a lot out of you. Mm-hmm. Um, was there something, like, how, how did you find the centeredness I think to do like that work it strikes me as like a core part of your personality in Mm -hmm. some ways that Mm -hmm. either that work transformed you or you brought that to the work already I don't know Mm. gosh Um, probably how did it change you yeah I well you know I almost died when I was 20 so having lived through that experience and I experienced a near-death experience so I felt I feel really differently about death Mm -hmm. um It transformed me all of the time. I think one of my friends, teachers, mentors, her name's Dr. Berg, she did um, pediatric palliative care and hospice. She brought me in to do peds. I've been only working with adults for some years, and she said, Annie, why don't you try peds? And I was like, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh. But what I loved about hospice, what I love about hospice is that to me is is such a beautiful model of healthcare because Mm -hmm. we have our medical teams, but we also have social work. We also have chaplains or spiritual care. We also have complementary and alternative therapists. We also have pet therapists. Like there's this whole array of humans taking care of somebody that I love. Mm -hmm. And I, I used to just love, it was really hard. And it was, it just felt like such sacred work. Each day when I would come in, I had this like morning ritual where I would kind of spend some time before I would enter the premises and before I would pick up my senses for the day and think about who are each of these people that I get to touch today that I get to work on and you know and even closing a massage and holding their feet thinking about all the places that their feet touched while they were walking around this earth there was this for me such a just a miraculous experience of like, wow, for today, mm-hmm. I get to be alive. I get to experience life. I am capable of walking and thinking and moving and creating. And it's, it was so interesting to go from that environment or to the different homes where I would see patients and then back into what I would call like everyday life where right. we're not as aware of our mortality or at all. And it was so interesting to work in between those two spaces like there were years that I would work three days a week at the hospice and three days a week in a hotel spa Mm -hmm. and it was so interesting to just complete juxtaposition different (laughs) (laughs) and so it was I don't know I just it's really special work and I think Mm -hmm. as I continue on in my career I'll probably carve out some clinical time again I notice in my body I miss Mm -hmm. being bedside I miss taking care of people Mm -hmm. I miss I miss the clinical aspect. I just, I love it. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. I love the way you speak about that with with such heart. <laughs> oh, thank you. I have this, I wish so much that we as a culture treated end of life like we do beginning of life. Mm-hmm. 
I used to think about this. There was this really great pamphlet we had at Nathan Adelson that we would give our patients and their families. And the first time I read it, it's called Preparing for the Final Stages. But it reminded me, a lot of my friends were having babies at that time. And I was like, this is kind of like the what to expect when you're expecting, <laughs> but for death. <laughs> I, I remember being at a bookstore relatively shortly thereafter and thinking, we have all of this stuff on birth, which is great. And only some of us will become mothers. Right. And then the section on end of life is, you know, this big, but all of us will die. So mm-hmm. I, I feel really strongly about really advocating for a good death, advocating, really just honoring that whole life cycle. I think the more I remember that my time here is precious, the better I live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're reminding me of a dear colleague that I worked with at East Carolina who was a palliative care nurse for mm most of her um, career, and she would always tell the students when she would come and teach in my class, the only diagnosis for sure you will share with all your patients is death. Yeah. Um, but you're right. There's there's a lot about, um, like, the way society sort of uh, treats the topic yeah. that makes us shy away from it sometimes. Uh-huh. Um, so... Um, but also, like, uh, it provides an interesting example of how to fully do integrated care the way uh-huh. that you would envision it for the rest of like living care right yeah so, yeah well uh, tell us a little bit about where your office's work is going I know that you've um, oh, recently that. um had some new team members your your team has grown a bit since you started uh, <laughs> as a lone person <laughs> <laughs> thank goodness um, what are the plans for the office kind of moving forward what's the dream oh, the dream yeah. so we'll start with the north star the dream <laughs> yeah <laughs> way back The dream is that integrative center, really. And as we work backwards from there, it's um, really bringing this into all of our clinical spaces. This is creating a team. Right now, I'm so fortunate. I work with incredible people. Um, Kathy Polly is our manager of well-being and integrative medicine. Dr. Tanya Crabb is our senior psychologist. And Dr. Shivan Chaudhry is our associate um, director of integrative medicine and assistant professor. So it's amazing to have these people on our team. I would love to see us expand. I'd love to hire additional faculty that could help us really build out that culinary medicine component Mm -hmm. that could help Shivan and I expand our integrative medicine classes so that we can bring it into GME, we can, our graduate resident, um, our residents, and also really help create that fellowship that I'd like to see. Um, I'd love to see our well-being office grow. Um, I was really lucky a couple of years ago I got to do, Stanford has a chief wellness officer training that I was able to go to. And so returning from that a couple of years ago, I came up with a plan of really infusing integrative medicine and well-being into every department. So, I mean, well-being primarily, where... Mm -hmm. There's representation from each department that is focused on well-being, and they would have a FTE appointment to work on that. But having that where it's not just a one-off because one person can't change well-being in an organization. I've tried, but we need (laughs) it's more fun to do it with more people. And Mm -hmm. the people that are in each department know best what they need. So I'd love to see it be much more of a grassroots effort. Mm -hmm where it's like a both and where yeah. leaderships and really seeing like well-being centered leadership like i want to see modeling of please take vacations please take a lunch hour please mm-hmm. have email boundaries and time so that we can model this and take care of ourselves and really um, step into that mm-hmm. so i think hiring more people and then down the road really building that whole thing out Wonderful. I love that. And speaking of North Stars, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so we've been talking a lot about this concept at the School of Medicine mm-hmm. in that uh, people's individual North Stars mm-hmm. are a lot about like what's the immovable um, guiding principle for your life that mm-hmm. sort of guides your passion mm-hmm. and thinking a little bit about how that aligns with the School of Medicine. Mm-hmm. But I'm curious, um, what is your North Star? Like, what keeps you going every day? Like, what is it that you wish to do with your career, your life? 
it's a big question. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is. I love it, though. Yeah. That North Star exercise we did mm-hmm. a couple of years ago. For me, it's, it's really about while we're on this planet, really bringing as much kindness and compassion and love to this planet as I can and, and living, yeah. you know, like really living lives. So I love, I love being here. I love being with friends. My North star is community. My North star is connection. And my North star is just trying to make it a little bit better while I'm here. You know, whatever that means, like it's, I think it's different for each person. But for me, it's like, while I'm here, I, I want this life to be full and rich and of service. It's really important to me to, to be in service of mm-hmm. others. Mm-hmm. Terrific. Yeah. Um, well, and as we get ready to close, um, mm-hmm. another thing we always like to ask our guests is to share with us um, their moments of joy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I always think that's such a lovely way to end these mm-hmm. conversations because it, it brings us kind of into the present moment in mm-hmm. some ways. My moments of joy calling the people I love and telling them that I love them. Cups of coffee, for sure. (laughs) Glittery fingernails. (laughs) Glitter, for sure. Being with students. Um, Being outside and watching the cycles of nature Mm -hmm. just reminds me that it's all in flux. Well, thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing your passion, your heart for the work. Uh, We appreciate you uh, and all of the work that you do every day here at the School of Medicine. Thank you. It's a lot of fun. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for listening. As always, we are grateful for your time and attention. If you enjoyed the episode, please check out our other podcasts. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with others. Thank you.